Business failure. In this short video, we will look at the legal consequences of business failure, focusing especially upon bankruptcy. The legal consequences of business failure vary depending upon the particular business structure that the business owner has adopted. So if the business is structured around the business owner as an individual, in other words, if the business structure is a sole trader or a partnership, then the possible legal consequences of business failure include receivership, bankruptcy, and the various alternatives to bankruptcy. However, if the chosen business structure was a company, then the legal consequences of business failure include receivership, liquidation, and administration. So we'll look at each of these in turn, beginning with receivership, which is a consequence that could apply to both individuals and corporations. A receiver is a person appointed to take control of some or all of a business and its assets. So a receiver may be appointed by the court or by a secured creditor who wishes to enforce their security. Many uh, business loan contracts will contain a provision granting the lender or creditor the right to appoint a receiver in the event that the borrower or the debtor defaults on the loan. The receiver is appointed to step in and take control of the business temporarily in order to generate enough money to repay the outstanding debt. So the receiver may choose to sell off some of the business's assets or to sell the business itself or to simply run the business in a different manner in order to generate more income and make it possible to repay the outstanding debt. So once the receiver has sold enough assets or generated enough income to repay the outstanding secured debt, the management of the business is returned to the business owners. Alternatively, the receiver may decide that it's not possible for the business itself to generate enough money to repay the debt and the receiver may decide that it's more appropriate that the business go into bankruptcy or liquidation. Bankruptcy is a legal process by which a trustee is appointed to sell a debtor's assets to repay their debts. At the conclusion of the process, all of the debtor's debts are forgiven, even if they have not been repaid in full. Bankruptcy is regulated in Australia by the Bankruptcy Act of 1966, which is federal legislation. Very quickly, the process of bankruptcy is as follows. It begins with either a debtor's petition or a creditor's petition. The debtor is formally declared bankrupt by the court, and a trustee in bankruptcy is appointed. That trustee in bankruptcy will manage the bankruptcy process. They will begin by calling upon all of the people who are owed money by the bankrupt person to identify themselves and lodge what is known as a proof of debt. The trustee in bankruptcy will then gather in all of the bankrupt person's assets and sell them in order to generate money to repay those debts. The money will be distributed to the creditors and usually there is not enough money to go around so there is an order of priority and many people will receive less than the total amount that they are owed by the bankrupt person. At the end of the process the person is discharged from bankruptcy and they walk away debt free. So a person can become bankrupt either voluntarily by themselves lodging a debtor's petition or as a result of action taken by unpaid creditors who have lodged a creditor's petition. To apply for a creditor's petition, the creditor or creditors must be owed at least $5,000 and they must establish that the debtor has committed an act of bankruptcy within the previous six months. It's the act of bankruptcy that satisfies the court that it is appropriate that the person be declared bankrupt. The most commonly relied upon act of bankruptcy is a failure to comply with the bankruptcy notice. So a creditor who is owed money by the bankrupt person will have their lawyers draw up a formal bankruptcy notice which demands payment within a statutory period and when the debtor fails to make payment within the statutory period that is an act of bankruptcy which triggers the formal bankruptcy process. If at the hearing of the creditor's petition the court decides that the debtor should in fact be declared bankrupt, it will issue what is known as a sequestration order. And the effect of the sequestration order is to make the debtor formally bankrupt. Upon being made bankrupt, the debtor's assets will automatically vest in the trustee in bankruptcy who is appointed by the court. And the trustee in bankruptcy's job is to try and discharge, as far as possible, the bankrupt person's outstanding debts. So the trustee will first contact the debtor's creditors and place advertisements calling upon any person to whom the debtor owes money to identify themselves and lodge a proof of debt. The proof of debt is a formal request for payment. 
the debtor is entitled to keep certain assets so they do not lose everything to the bankruptcy process. They are entitled to keep assets that they own on trust, most ordinary household and personal items. They can keep their tools that they use to earn an income up to a statutory limit. They can keep a vehicle up to a fairly modest statutory limit. They can keep life insurance policies, their superannuation, any compensation that they've received for personal injury, and awards of a sporting, cultural, military, or academic nature, such as medals or trophies, but only if the creditors agree to allow them to keep these things. So the trustee automatically becomes the owner of all of the assets of the bankrupt person at the time at which they declare bankrupt, but it's also possible for the trustee to recover assets that the bankrupt person may have disposed of prior to their bankruptcy. One way is via the doctrine of relation back. The bankruptcy is deemed to have commenced on the date of the first act of bankruptcy within the six months prior to the presentation of the creditor's petition. So it's not actually the date that the formal order by the court is made, but it's actually an earlier date at which the bankruptcy commenced, and anything the bankrupt person owned at that time automatically vests in the trustee in bankruptcy. It's also possible for the trustee in bankruptcy to use the voidable transaction provisions to recover property that may have been disposed by the bankrupt person even earlier. Voidable transactions include any property seized within the previous six months under a writ of execution or a garnishee order, so the trustee in bankruptcy can track down that property and get it back. Property that was transferred at a time when the debtor was insolvent to a creditor in repayment of an outstanding debt such that the creditor has received an unfair preference within the previous six months. So if in the period of six months prior to the formal commencement of the bankruptcy, the bankrupt person actually repaid one of their debts in full or in part, then the trustee in bankruptcy can track that person down and get them to give back the money or the property that they received and force them to wait in line with all of the other people who are owed money by the bankrupt person. The trustee in bankruptcy can recover property transferred for no consideration, in other words, that was given away, or that was transferred for less than market value, in other words, it was sold very cheaply, to a non-related entity within the previous two years, to a related entity within the previous four years, or to any entity within the previous five years if the transferee is unable to prove that the debtor was solvent at the time. Finally, the trustee in bankruptcy can recover property that was transferred with the intention of protecting it from the bankruptcy process and keeping it away from creditors, and there's no time limit on this one. So the intent of these voidable transaction provisions is to stop a person from undermining the bankruptcy process by giving away or selling very cheaply their property prior to the commencement of their bankruptcy. For example, the person may have sold their expensive sports car or their yacht to a close friend for a very cheap price on the understanding that after the bankruptcy has been concluded that they would get the property back. These voidable transaction provisions allow the trustee in bankruptcy to nevertheless track down that expensive car or boat and include it in the bankruptcy process, i.e. to sell those items of property and use the money to repay the bankrupt person's debts. People who are dealing with the bankrupt person legitimately will not be caught by these provisions, so a person to whom the debtor has transferred property may be able to avoid having to transfer that money or property to the trustee if they can establish that they had no notice of the debtor's insolvency and the transaction was in good faith and in the ordinary course of business. Once the trustee has sold the debtor's assets and recovered as much of the estate as possible, they will distribute the estate as quickly as possible amongst those of the creditors who have lodged a proof of debt. Now, there is an order of payment. Not everyone is treated equally. The costs, fees, and expenses of the administration, including the trustee's remuneration, are paid first. Second, if the bankrupt person owned a business, then the wages, superannuation, and other entitlements of their employees are paid out. And finally, all of the other unsecured creditors share in whatever remains. There will usually not be enough money to go around, and so each of these unsecured creditors will usually receive only a portion of the amount that they are owed. After the bankruptcy process has come to an end, the debtor will be discharged from bankruptcy. Normally a bankruptcy process only goes for three years. Sometimes it is annulled earlier than the three years and sometimes it is extended 
because the trustee in bankruptcy has an objection to the person being automatically discharged after three years. If the objection is successful, the bankruptcy may be extended to either five years or even eight years. Upon being discharged from bankruptcy, the debtor is released from their debts, even if they have not been repaid in full. There are, however, some debts which the person will continue to be liable to repay. These include court penalties and fines, payments that they have to make under a successful damages claim, child support and maintenance debts remain payable, as do student fee help debts and student loans, and debts incurred by fraud. Their name will always appear on the National Personal Insolvency Index, which means that it will be very difficult in future to borrow large sums of money or to start a new business. Because of the significant negative consequences of a person being formally declared bankrupt, the legislation does contain a number of alternatives to bankruptcy, which attempt to do the same thing, i.e. divide the person's assets amongst their creditors without the person being formally declared bankrupt. The Bankruptcy Act contains two main alternatives to bankruptcy. These are Part 9 debt agreements for smaller estates and Part 10 personal insolvency agreements for larger estates. If the debtor fails to comply with either of these arrangements, the creditors will be able to resume their recovery proceedings, including having the person declare bankrupt. Failure to comply with one of these agreements is an act of bankruptcy within the meaning of the legislation. We saw earlier that bankruptcy is a process that is only applicable to individuals. If the business structure was a corporation, then the equivalent process is liquidation. Liquidation is also known as winding up. The process is very similar to bankruptcy, although there are some important differences. So the overall process is that the company is insolvent, there is an application by one or more of the company's creditors, the court orders that the company be wound up or liquidated, a liquidator is appointed, and here the liquidator is the equivalent of the trustee in bankruptcy. The liquidator calls for the people who are owed money by the company to identify themselves and lodge a proof of debt. The liquidator recovers and sells the company's assets in order to generate a pool of monies that can be used to repay the company's creditors. The liquidator distributes the funds to the creditors, and at the end of the process the company is deregistered. That is one of the differences between liquidation and bankruptcy. At the end of bankruptcy, the person walks away debt-free. At the end of liquidation, the company is deregistered and ceases to exist. There is an alternative to liquidation, given that the negative consequences of liquidation are very, very serious for the company. So voluntary administration is a mechanism by which an insolvent company can enter a temporary safety zone away from its creditors' claims while a decision is made by its creditors on what the company should do next. So the administrator is appointed to temporarily manage the company and after only usually a few weeks the administrator calls a meeting of the creditors in order to give them advice about what they should do next. During the period of the voluntary administration all of the people who are owed money by the company have to suspend their proceedings in order to give the administrator time to work out what the best course of action is going to be. So the options that are presented to the creditors will include that the company be returned to the control of its board of directors and the company be allowed to trade through this difficult period and perhaps repay all of the money that it owes. Or the administrator may recommend that the company be immediately paced into liquidation. Or the administrator may recommend that a deed of company arrangement be executed. And this deed of company arrangement is simply an agreement between the company and its creditors that sets out what changes need to be made to the way in which the company is being run and the amount of money that the creditors are claiming in order to allow the company to continue to operate. Placing the company into administration and allowing the company to continue to operate under a deed of company arrangement is often a more attractive option for the creditors because they will receive more than they would receive if the company was immediately placed into liquidation.